Yeah. Here we are again. Good evening, everyone. Thanks again for joining. We're in Psalm 18. We're going to be reading and praying tonight, and I hope that you are ready to do same. I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock. Please type in the comments. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. So earlier when we got started, we were counting the number of positions that have been attributed to the Lord Jesus in this verse of Psalm 18. And we counted eight, but let's do that again. He's my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength, my buckler, the horn of my salvation and my high tower. So eight roles have been given to God here. He plays the role of being our rock. Now, if you recall, when the Israelites were moving out of Egypt and they had to sojourn in the wilderness, you might recall that there were a few instances in which they had to rely on the rock. The Bible says that the rock followed them, okay? It accompanied them out of Egypt into the promised land. It's the said rock that Moses struck and from which flowed water, that rock. Christ Jesus was actually the rock that was following them, okay? Christ was very much in the wilderness, assisting with the deliverance of God's people out of Egypt, which you know represents a place of bondage. Amen. So whenever the Israelites became thirsty and excessively thirsty, they would usually get water from the rock. So what is the psalmist saying when he says, you are my rock? He's simply saying, that when I'm thirsty spiritually, I know just where to go in order to be quenched. I know how to get my soul filled again. I know how to be refreshed again. I know how to be revived again. Christ Jesus happens to have all the water that I need and not just any kind of water, but he gives unto all of us who are in need, living water. Someone say amen. So Christ gets the position of being the rock because in fact he is. Then the psalmist says, thou art my fortress. What does that mean? What is a fortress? A fortress is a strong hold a military stronghold it is a place that has a very strong defense mechanism okay and if we think about it from the point of view of military stronghold then right away you're going to imagine in your mind soldiers okay soldiers with varying types of ammunitions okay and i want you to see them guarding a city okay a military base, see a military base or see soldiers on base where they're going to be fighting, okay, in war, all right? That place where the soldiers usually are is a place where the civilians, the ordinary civilians do not really want to go, okay? The fact that you see these soldiers being well armed and you know that they're in the mindset to war, you don't even want to cross their paths because you don't know if they're going to see you as a culprit, okay, or as an invader. So you want to trot carefully whenever you come across a military base. And so the Bible says the Lord is our fortress, okay? He is our military stronghold. Hallelujah. So understand, people of God, that God is around us. He's not just in us, but he's also around us. We are in God. Hallelujah. And, and so God has become that defense mechanism, okay, to replace what would have ordinarily been the, the, 
the soldiers and all the various things and parties that make up a strong military base or a strong army. God is all of that. Hallelujah. God alone is all of that. He's Jehovah Sabaoth. He does not even need the help of his angels. His angels work for him. But he alone is God. He alone can get the job done. Hallelujah. He's our all-sufficient God. Glory to God. So when we abide in him, we need not look for any kind of external defense mechanism in the flesh. When we are in God, understand that wherever we go, we go with this fire around us. Wherever we go, we go with all of these instruments of war around us. Wherever we go, hallelujah, we go with swords around us wherever we go. We go with high-tech ammunition in the spirit, even through the word of God. People of God, did you know that the weapon that we need to fight demons are not physical? They're not carnal. So we don't need to get rifles for real. We don't need to go to a gun store to purchase rifles. We don't need to get missiles in the flesh. Understand that our equivalent of missiles toward demonic powers in the spirit have come in the form of words, but not just any words. They must be the word of God. The Bible says the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. When you release the word of God, people of God, you release in the realm of the spirit weapons of mass destruction. You don't understand. So many times we feel like we need a whole company of people to pray with us and for us when we are up against some demonic spirits you don't understand that one psalm just one verse just one scripture just recite just that one powerful verse that speaks of fear or whatever it is that the enemy is seeking to do to you you draw for the scripture that talks about that and that one scripture alone will cause such a shaking in the spirit will drive such a fear upon the enemy and that's the fear of God and that's the fear of Christ Jesus who has the dripping blood that has ransomed you you just release that scripture and you'll be amazed to see the effects in the atmosphere so we're on the point that God is our military stronghold. We walk in God. God is in us, but we are also in God. Okay? And by virtue of being in God and, and knowing that he totally surrounds us, we got to understand that we are surrounded by weapons of war because one of his names is Jehovah Sabaoth. He's the Lord of hosts. Therefore, he's in charge of the greatest army. China's army ain't as big as this army. Hallelujah! Glory to God. The weapons and ammunition that China has, so, hallelujah, and wherever else, Russia, are nothing compared to what the army of God has and contains. Oh, glory to God. There are some weapons that China has never seen. There are weapons and missiles that the most high tech and the most expert or experienced country in war has never seen or imagined oh glory to god god has it in his army and every time you walk understand that those weapons are visible to the enemy and that's why we want to make sure that we release the word of god because every time we release the word it's like we command a weapon to be launched and to be released see you can be walking with the weapons but if you're quiet what use will the weapons have if you ain't speaking to give them their release they'll just be there a souvenir we don't want that if the word is in you you better know when to speak it you better know how to speak it every time you speak the word you release a sword every time you speak the word you create damage in the satanic kingdom 
every time you release a word, a devil trembles. Every time you draw for the word, Satan has got to regroup, re-strategize, and do something because he knows that it's war time. The word is a sword. You know you engage in warfare when you draw for the word. In other words, you might not have told yourself that you want to fight. You probably are not even in the mood to do any kind of warfare because of how you've been feeling. But did you know the moment you start to quote scriptures and speak them in your atmosphere, you have already subscribed to warfare. It's war because you've pulled out a sword. Hallelujah. Do you understand me? You in your house and you probably are saying, boy, I'm not even feeling like praying right now. I'm not even in the mood to deal with no devil right now. But then you find yourself just start releasing some words. Th those are swords. And we draw for swords when we're ready to fight. We don't play with swords. Swords are weapons. They're not toys. Once swords become displayed and visible, it means wartime, not playtime. Okay? We don't play with swords. We fight with them. Okay? And swords can be very deadly. Swords can be very life-threatening. They're not to be played with. So understand that when you use scripture, you got to be prepared for anything. Anything might happen. But just know that you should and shall win. Okay? Once you engage in war, the enemy might start to attack. So therefore, you might start reciting scriptures in your atmosphere and all of a sudden you feel a little headache. You might start speaking the word in your atmosphere and all of a sudden you have shortness of breath. It's not unusual for that to happen. Why? Because you're in war now. You started it, okay? Or maybe the enemy is the one who first started it and you were led by the Spirit of God to release the sword, which is the word. Okay? And because it's war, the enemy ain't going to just sit there and not do something. He's going to do something. And sometimes what he does in that moment comes in the form of an attack to your physical body. Okay? You were fine all along. All of a sudden, you start feeling cramps in your belly. You drew out a sword. Now the enemy's fighting back. You were fine all along. Now, all of a sudden, it, it, it feels like you, one of your ears is blocked. You are hearing fine, but all of a sudden, understand that it's war. Okay? It's war. The enemy is going to fight back. But know that you are going to win. If you continue, and if you believe in the words that you're speaking, if you believe in the strength and power of your sword, victory is yours. Okay, but I'm glad I'm mentioning this because I want people to know that it's not unusual that you can be drawing out your sword, which is the word of God, and you come under attack. Of course you can because it's wartime. Anytime you are speaking scripture, anytime you are releasing the word, no weapon formed against me shall prosper and this and that and blah, blah, blah. Greater is he that is in me. That's a sword. That's war. Anything can happen to you in that hour. If you're not careful, don't be surprised if it does happen. I am here to tell you, every time you recite scripture, you engage in warfare. Okay? You're fighting. So don't be surprised if you recognize that the enemy is fighting back. Okay? So we said he is your rock. And what did we say about the rock? We said... It is out of the rock that comes water, water from Christ to refresh your spirits come out of the rock. The rock is Christ. And guess what is the water? The water is the word. The word comes out of him. The word is a part of him. Oh, glory to God. And that is confirmed in the book of John that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Amen. So the, the Lord has always been the rock, even the one that we saw in the wilderness when the Israelites were 
being delivered. We say that he is our military stronghold. Now we're on to him being our deliverer. 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 From whence cometh the term deliverance. We need a deliverer whenever we are entrapped. We need deliverance whenever we are being held as captives and whenever we are being held against our will. For reasons such as those, among other things, we would need deliverance. Psalm 91 talks about us being delivered from the snare of the fowler. Understand that every day the enemy sets all these snares for us, okay? And the snares come in different ways. Sometimes the snare might take the form of a sickness that he had plotted overnight. Sometimes the snare might come in the form of an altercation between you and your husband or if you're a husband between you and your wife. Sometimes the snares come in the form of verbal attacks, verbal abuse. Sometimes the snares come in the form of accusations. Sometimes the snares come in the form of just different things. You think it, you name it, snares. Issues on the job, a snare. A setup on the job, that's a snare. Someone to just interfere with your peace on the job, that's a snare, because that is going to lead to termination if you're not careful. And for reasons like this, we need deliverance. We need a deliverer, okay? When the enemy sets up all these traps for us in our various spaces, we're going to need to get out. And the process of getting out or escaping these ensnarements is called deliverance. And if we're going to experience deliverance, there ought to be a deliverer. And the ultimate deliverer is Christ Jesus. I want you to recognize that already the psalmist is making you know that Jesus Christ wears many hats. We're on to the third hat that this writer attributes to him. The first hat that was given to him was him being a rock, then him being a military stronghold. Now we are learning that it is he who takes us out of snares and as a result has been called deliverer. Now let's find out what else he's called. He's called God my god so he's not just my lord but he's also my deity he is my god he is my supreme being he is the one who i believe and know for sure has created all things so not only is he my lord as in my master but he's also the one I recognize as being the creator of all things. So he is my God. The other thing is, he's also my strength. There is a saying, and it's scriptural too, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And recently I heard someone turn it around and it also makes sense. They say, not only is the joy of the Lord my strength, but the strength of the Lord is my joy. Okay? So from this God, we get strength. He's the one who allows us to face the various battles that come our way on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. Hallelujah. Had it not been for him, we would not have faced the giants we have managed to face had it not been for him. We would not have remained standing. We would not have remained steadfast, unshakable, and unmovable had it not been for him and his strength. Had he not undergirded us with his love, had he not intervened, had he not been at our right hand, had he not been our rear guard, had he not been our shield, had he not been our might, we would have lost it a long time ago. 
and we probably would not have known this moment. So we thank God for his strength because some of the things that life throws at us have come with the intent of weakening us. And so we want strength. We need strength. And the reason we are here today knowing that life has thrown so much at us already is a testament of the fact that indeed Christ is our strength. When a mother loses a son, Christ becomes her strength. That's why she has not taken her own life. When a mother loses her one child or loses her favorite daughter or any of her children or a father, when he loses his son, or when his son gets sentenced to life in prison, what causes him to get up every day? What causes him to put food in his mouth again? What causes him to go to work every day? It's the strength of the Lord. It's certainly not his strength. Oh, glory to the living God. When a mother has to watch her child be on drugs, being homeless. Sometimes people are homeless not because people have put them out, but their own decisions have caused them to be there. Some of them, they've been invited time and time again, come back home, but they refuse to because the enemy has taken them so deep into their folly. And their minds are so much controlled by Satan and Satanism that they would rather stay out there than to come into a place of safety. Now for a mother or father to watch such a thing or a sibling who loves her brother or sister to see them deteriorate and feel like they don't have the power to change it. Let me tell you, let me tell you what gets those siblings going. Let me tell you what gets those parents going. Why they can smile when you see them. Why they can function in their right senses when you see them. It's because the joy of the Lord is their strength. God has given them strength. They're definitely not operating of their own. If you ask them, if you should really interview these individuals and find out what was really in their hearts concerning revenge or concerning how to handle the situation in their flesh, you'd be amazed to hear what they would say. So when one can come to church and shout hallelujah, when the tough gets going and the going gets tough, that's not one strength that you're seeing at work or on display. That's the strength of the Lord himself. Hallelujah. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining so far. We are on Psalm 18, we're, we're going to be going into a time of prayer shortly, but we're just dissecting a little bit as we set the tone and atmosphere for the prayers that shall go forth. Remember, if you're watching on Facebook as you join to hit that share button, that's the only way others will know that we're here. Ensure that you give the video a like, especially if you're watching on YouTube. That's the only way others will be able to join in and benefit from the powerful, fiery prayers that we will be praying in our midst tonight. So I want you to type in the comments, please share. Please share. If you haven't yet done so, please share on TikTok. Thank you for joining. As you join, please ensure that you like. I feel like we can do better with the likes over there. Am I correct, soldier girl? Welcome, thank you for joining. All right, glory to God. So let's go on to the Lord being our buckler. A buckler is a tiny shield that is usually held with, held by a string. A string is attached to the back of it, and usually it is worn around the arm, or one can grip it by the hand, glory to God, but it's not usually as big 
as a shield or as some of the shields we have seen, okay? A buckler though serves a similar purpose. It's just different in size. And we thank God that he is that to us so that when the fiery darts of the enemy are coming our way, even without notice, and when they're coming in groups from varying directions, we're glad to know that God through Christ is our buckler. When we have Christ in us, hallelujah, and we are in him, no weapon that is formed against us shall prosper. Hallelujah. When Christ is our shield and our buckler indeed, the enemy will try and he'll come in different ways. But the Bible says that they shall come against you one way, but shall flee in seven different ways. Oh, glory to God. So all of these powers that are headed toward you from the northeast, the northwest, the north, the south, the southeast, each one of them, when God is through reversing and causing a ricochet effect of their darts in the spirit, them darts are going to have to be split up because of the power that's going to block them. Them darts, each one of them is going to be so shattered, oh glory to God. They're going to disintegrate as they go back because his power is of such that nothing Nothing is too strong for it. Nothing can successfully wage war against it. Nothing can penetrate it. Nothing can survive it that is intended to kill it. it it's not, it's not going to happen. The Bible says that God has given Christ, his son, all authority. He has raised him up higher than principalities and higher than these said powers that are coming toward his children. And if Christ is inside of his children, that higher power through Christ is going to raise up a standard Hence the reason the Bible says that when the enemy comes in like a flood, he's coming in from all angles, left, right, you name it, front, back, from up, from down, from beneath. He will always raise up a standard for his children. Tell two people, ensure that you are a child of his all these things I'm talking about are guaranteed for those who are truly his. Okay? If you're still a stranger, then you have not yet arrived at that place where you can be assured of these protections. Okay? So I want to say to someone, if you're outside of a covenant, you're not yet in a covenant or a relationship with Christ, come into there soon get to that place as quickly as possible there are many benefits okay many benefits to be derived from a personal relationship with christ okay some of the things that you're trying to handle by yourself when you're in that love relationship christ handles them for you so tell two people Get to know Christ, submit to Christ, and trust your life to Christ. Speak it louder so they may hear. Then the writer says, he is the horn of my salvation. He has an eternal and everlasting reign in our lives as our savior 
that's what it means when the writer says he is the horn of our salvation. He is always going to be our savior. From everlasting to everlasting, he shall always reign as the one who saves us and as the only one who is capable of doing so. All right? That's what it means by him being called the horn of our salvation. Then the other role that has been attributed to him is the role of being our high tower or high tower or high tower i'm hearing the name of the lord is a strong tower the righteous runs into it and they are safe he's our what high tower so in the high tower there should be this imagination that the higher you go from ground level the further away you will be from the reach of the enemy okay on ground level if there are soldiers coming to get you it's going to be easy for them to find you if you remain on ground level even if there are obstacles before you that separate the two of you by virtue of the fact that the two of you are on the same level then we would not be surprised if the enemy finds a way to maneuver these obstacles and get to you as long as you are on the same level you'll also be in his sight you're always going to be in his periphery, so to speak. But when you're in the tower of God, I want you to see height. I want you to see elevation. And I want you to not just see height, but see the material that makes up the structure in which you are. Towers are not made from wood. Anybody agrees? Have you ever seen a wooden tower? Has anyone ever visited the Haifa Tower? What material makes it up? Is it wood? I've never been there. Can you tell us, please, what makes up that tower? Is it paper that they use to make it? Anybody knows? What have they used to make the tower? Paper? Mud? What is it? When you think of a tower, you're thinking of a structure that is well fortified, a structure that is strong even in its foundation. Now, I am not an engineer, but I know some basic things about buildings and construction. So here's what I've learned based on observation. I did not even read. I just watched and learned. The higher a building is going to be, my God, hallelujah. Tell me about the foundation. The higher the building, the deeper the foundation. Anybody agrees? How about you? On Facebook, on YouTube, tell me. Hello? Have you ever observed when high-rise buildings are being constructed in your own country, and overseas. Have you ever noticed that the higher they intend to go above ground, the deeper the foundation that they create underground? Amen? Because they bear in mind certain factors, factors such as the impact that an earthquake might have on the construction the impact that flooding might have, the impact of all manner of hazards and natural disasters might have on the structure. All of these things are factored into the building process. Amen? So when we think of a tower, think of not just height, but also the firmness of the structure that makes it 
And here I am adding a third thing that you need to think about. Think about the foundation. The foundation of a tower is very solid. The foundation of a tower is firm. The foundation of a tower has a lot of steel. Hallelujah. And all the materials that one deems as being fit or fittest for construction, they're in the foundation. God is your tower. God is your foundation. And when the enemy is running in, hallelujah, when you run into that tower, he dare not even come to the door of it. Oh, glory to God. He dares not even come to the door of it. Hallelujah. You see, there are some things that the enemy is permitted to do, but he cannot surpass his limit or his boundaries. I'm telling you. Under God's permissive will, Satan gets to do some things. But wherever God has put the cap or the limit, that's it for him. He can't pass it. So sure enough, he might cause you to have the palpitation issues. Your heart might race, but I bet you he will not get the permission to give you a stroke or a heart attack. You're not understanding. He has a limit. You're not understanding. Sure enough, he can cause your skin to itch. But perhaps God did not give him the permission to give you leprosy or HIV or AIDS. You're not understanding. Perhaps he got the chance to strike you with HIV, herpes, and some kind of STD. But because of the limit, Maybe he don't get the power to cause your skin to break out in sores all over and your skin to rot and start to smell. He never got that. Understand that he can do so much and no more. He cannot pass his limit. And I'm not talking about those who belong to him. Let me make that clear. Just in case the false doctrine that has been circulated all over will have you thinking that you're not in Christ and you're safe. You are not safe if you're not in Christ. There's no going around it. Christ is life. Christ is savior. If you have no dealings with Christ, it means your master is Satan. And if you work for him, the wages of sin is death. He's gonna pay you. He's gonna give you your wage. And he might give you some bonus to it. But remember, the wage is death. Are you understanding, family? So I want to make sure that I point out that all of these amazing benefits I'm talking about are for those people who live by faith in God through Christ. The just shall live by faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All those who took up their cross, all those who denied themselves, they are the ones who shall receive of the benefits. Make no mistake. I'm not here to give anybody any false hope by making you know that you can live anyhow yet still find safety in Christ. It ain't gonna work. You ain't gonna do you and your child continues to do her and your son is doing him and then you expect that there's going to be the faithfulness of God and all the benefits of being in a godly covenant with him you're going to expect them in your house it's not going to happen if your family serves the devil what do you think is going to happen? The devil as master 
is going to do as he pleases. And part of the reason families are still surviving even though they serve the devil is because we are under the dispensation of grace. Grace is the reason why many of us are still here. Grace is the reason I am still here. But I know that so often, even in today's world, we have come to a place where we start to generalize the word of God and it shall not be so. The devil is a liar. And the spirit of God is not pleased with this generalization that is taking place. Every word is not for everybody. And we need to stop telling people the nice outcomes without telling them the conditions that must be met before they can experience a certain outcome. See, if I refuse to tell you that before you can experience the blessing that you're going to have to walk blamelessly before God and you're going to have to assert yourself in an upright manner. If I don't include that in my message, then I have just given you a false hope and I shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ and answer to that. If I am a preacher, my responsibility is to preach and to preach the word as it is. I'm not going to tell you what the end of the sentence says and leave out the beginning of the sentence. And even if I didn't read the first few verses of the chapter, I'm going to summarize them for you. Because if the text, the base text is in the chapter, then therefore the rest of the chapter has something to do with the base text. So we're not doing false hope over here. We're not doing the fancy words and the giving the nice feelings to those with itching ears kind of thing over here. We don't do that here. Over here, we tell you as it is, and we say it to you in love that my brother and my sister, the only way Christ is going to be your rock, your fortress, your deliverer, your God, your strength, in whom you will trust, your buckler, your horn of salvation, and your high tower, is if you make him Lord and Savior over your life. But you can't be say, serving God and be serving the devil at the same time. It can't work. It cannot work. The misery that has come to many families and many households has arrived there because the master of the people who live there is the father of misery and agony and pain and torment and shame and embarrassment and things just upside down. He's the master of it. He's the one served there. If we want God to give us peace in our homes and in our hearts, he ain't gonna barge in and distribute peace. No. Uh-uh. He's a gentleman. He does not barge into places. Okay? And by default, the doors of our hearts are actually locked. <laughs> They're not open, unfortunately. They're not opened. And so for one to get into your heart, just like if you're a man, for the woman to have gotten into your heart, she had to knock. 
and then you let her in, now she's your wife. Ladies, for him to have come into your heart, he had to knock. And he knocked in many ways. He knocked when he showed up on Valentine's Day. He knocked when he got you your first birthday present because all the other men with whom you've been in relationships, they never saw it necessary to surprise you on your birthday. He knocked when he was there to comfort you and to dry your tears. And when you heard the knock, you didn't hesitate to let him in, right? Good. Now Christ does not barge into people's hearts. He does not kick down those doors, which we say are closed by default. Instead, he stands at the door like a gentleman. And he what? Hello? What does he do? At what time if we talk up the things then? <laughs> it's who that I tell me if we talk up the things them on YouTube. He does what? He knocks. And it's totally up to you whether or not you want to turn the knob and let him in. Okay? He's standing still on the outside of many people's hearts. He has not turned away yet. And while he still stands there, the scripture that says, seek the Lord while he may be found, applies to you. While he still stands there, you know that grace has not run out for you. A time will come when after a while he's going to stop knocking, you know. He's not going to tell two people he will not be knocking forever. I had to learn that the hard way. I'm so happy that I heard him just in time because he had been out there for a while. Grandmother talking to me. I don't want to hear her shut her down. Grandfather tried to put in his two pence and me shut him down too. Nobody could tell me anything. Yet I was burning inside because I heard the knock. I just did not want to answer the knock. Okay? Because I knew it was going to require a lot. And I felt like I wasn't capable, nor was I ready to take on those responsibilities and to meet those requirements because I, I probably just wanted to do me, okay? So while he knocks, it means grace is still available. I don't know, I, I came down this road, I was supposed to actually pray. So since I'm here, is there anyone who's listening to me who have been hearing a knock spiritually? Watch this. The knock you've been hearing does not literally sound like this. No. Let me explain the knock for you. The knock might come in the form of flashes of the image of Christ. The knock might come in the form of you feeling a need to go to church and you never had that desire in a while. The, the knock might take the form of you feeling like you want to hear some more about Jesus. The knock might take the form of you seeing supernatural things, divine things in your dreams. The sun talking to you 
the moon shining on you, the stars falling down on you, a voice speaking to you, horses and chariots coming to deliver you, great figures which are angels coming to rescue you and are always showing up and have been doing so over the past few days or weeks, the knock might take different forms. Have you been hearing a knock? Have you been feeling convicted when you come across certain channels, including this one on YouTube, Shadeen Anglin's channel, on TikTok and also on Facebook? Do you want to scroll past, but you just can't? You really want to skip past and get to whatever you were searching for, but for some reason you are stuck. For some reason, you're frozen. You want to move, but you can't move. There are so many other entertaining things to watch. But God has you here. It's the knock. Is there a man or woman in our midst tonight who wants to answer the knock you want to come and turn the knob he says behold i stand at the door and knock and if you let me in i will come in and i will sip with you anybody anybody's up for it hello if you are that person please raise your hands Hallelujah. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I confess my sins to you. I'm sorry for all the things I've said and done. I'm sorry for all the wrongs I've committed in my life. I'm deeply sorry for my transgressions and errors. And I ask that you pardon me. Blot out my iniquities, Lord. I'm not proud of who I have been. I am not proud of what I have done. I am not proud of my conversations. I am not proud, Lord. Forgive me. My heart is truly sorry. Christ Jesus, I now know that thou art the Christ, thou art the only savior for mankind. I now know that indeed, for God so loved the world that he gave us his only son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I now know that I can find grace through Christ. I now know that I can find my life through Christ. I now know that I can find my true identity in and through Christ. I now know that I can find my purpose, my reason for living and for getting up every day through Christ. I now know that I can find hope again through Christ. I now know that I can find change through Christ, transformation and real transformation through Christ. I now know I can find deliverance through Christ. I now know that I don't have to end the way I started. I now know I don't have to walk into my mom's footsteps. I now know that I don't have to follow the family patterns and traditions. I now know that all things are made possible and more in and through Christ. So today, I confess that Christ Jesus is Lord and Savior over my life. He died for me so that I might live and have life more abundantly. Lord Jesus Christ, I'm not worthy to have you. Nonetheless, Father, by grace, I am coming to you. And I'm asking that if I have found favor in your sight, that you will cleanse me and that you will 
reshape me and that you will use me according to your will. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he says, thy sins are forgiven. I've forgiven you. I've forgiven you. Now walk in this freedom. Now walk in this might. That's what the Lord said unto Gideon. He said, now go in this might. A weak Gideon who was threshing wheat in a wine press. That's like an oxymoron. You thresh wheat on a hill. Okay, you do wine or grapes in, in wine places and vineyards, but, but wheat don't belong there. A weak man in flesh, hiding from the Midians, who were sitting out to come and rob them of their harvest like they usually did. The Bible says that the people of Israel would plant and every time it was harvest time see the Midianites would hide out when they're doing their planting they had no business with them because these evil people were concerned with only getting the harvest so they watched them as they plowed they watched them as they dug they watched them as they bent their backs in the sun and as they lifted all them loads on a daily basis they did not show up at that time they only showed up when and it was harvest time hallelujah and once harvest came they would just take all of their vegetation and leave them impoverished so Gideon like many Israelites at the time was hiding because if the Midianites spotted what he had in his hand they would have come to rob him so he was for the most part weak weak yet the angel of the lord said unto him get up and i'm gonna use you to deliver these people out of the hands of the midianites now go in this might gideon was trying to put in an argument he was trying to say Oh Lord, but I am from the tribe of Manasseh. They are the weakest tribe. They're not so strong like Judah in warfare. I'm the least of my father's house as well. What are you talking about? Yet God says, get up and go in this might. It's not a fleshly might. It's not a carnal might. It's the might of God. It's might that we obtain through faith in God as our defense and as all the things we have named from Psalm 18 verse 2. Again, we said he is our rock. We said he is our fortress, our deliverer, our God, our strength, our buckler, the horn of our salvation and our high tower. Amen. You are saved by grace, not by your own works, but by the grace of God through Christ. Now desire two baptisms, your water baptism and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Very important. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Put your hands together for those who have heard the word and 
have turned in their hearts. That's where true turning begins, in your heart. We're going to be here tomorrow night. Maybe at that time we can do the prayers that I had intended for us to do tonight. I'm going to have to change the title of the live stream when I'm done. But tomorrow night at 8 p.m. on all my platforms, YouTube, Facebook, TikTok, I intend to be here and we're going to be led by the Holy Ghost again tomorrow night. Please turn on your notification. Ensure that before you leave this space, you give the video a like. And please ensure that you hit share, which is the option found just below the video. I also want to remind you that come this Friday, we'll be having the North Carolina encounter. Oh, there's something so important to say to you. So we're going to need a little bit more help in terms of the North Carolina encounter. But here's what I really want to emphasize. We're going to be going to Jersey. We're going to work toward that. We have not yet settled on a date, and there's a reason for that. It's either going to be next Saturday or the Saturday after. Let's see what happens. Remember, for all the encounters, we invite people to help to sponsor them, okay? We do not charge people to get into the encounters. And there's a reason for it. And I want nobody ask me, but why you don't this, why? No, people do what they were instructed to do. I do what I've been instructed by the Lord to do. He says, do not charge my people to get into an atmosphere in which they're going to be healed or delivered. And so whether I'm in Rome or wherever, even though this is the big US of A and everybody does this and they do their own thing, I'm not everybody else. I'm not going to do as the crowd does. I don't know who gave them their instructions, but the living God says, as for Shadeen Anglin, when she's going to pray for my people and deliver my people, she's not supposed to charge them a cent, okay? Are you hearing me? So everybody else can do what they want to do in their own groups. I'm not a part of their groups, okay? And I don't live to please them and I don't answer to them. Okay, because at the end of the day, if I disobey my father, who you think I'm going to show up to and who you think going to be in problems? You think it's them? A lot of them, they've already lost their way. A lot of them, they've already been fired by the living God. A lot of them, they're on the other side. They don't even belong to him. So how can I make the mistake of taking instructions from people just because everybody is doing it? Well, that's everybody. Okay? So if the Lord has touched your heart to sponsor any of our upcoming encounters, I said Friday we have North Carolina next week or the week after, depending on the date that we get um, or depending on the availability of the venue that we can afford, then we're going to be having a New Jersey encounter. You know what to do. The information is found by visiting shadeenangling.org forward slash donate. And as I say this, I'm going to ask that you put the information in the comments for me, someone. Chiquita or Abby Trini on TikTok, please type with me and for me. shadeenangling.org forward slash donate. If you're from my homeland, Jamaica, and you'd like to make a sponsorship, you know I have the information and I can always provide that through a WhatsApp message. I'll give you the bank details if you want to make a deposit. For those of you who do the cash ups and the Zells, cash up Shadeen Anglin, Zell 862-262-8144. And that number is for Zell purposes only. Please put these in the comments, 862 262-8144, then Shadeen Anglin is for Cash Up. Um, so write down the address for Friday's encounter in North Carolina if you haven't yet done so. Book signing starts between 6 o'clock and 7. Main service starts at 7. The address for the North Carolina experience this Friday, March 22, 
is the Legacy Center. And the Legacy Center is at 5501 Six Forks Road, Raleigh, 27609. The Legacy Center is at 5501 Six Forks Road, Raleigh, North Carolina, 27609. Okay, because it's not close by, it's like the further away we go, it's the more expense that, you know, comes with the encounter. But please continue to pray for us. We crave your prayers. And I want to thank those individuals who have supported us and those who continue to pray for us. We thank you. We appreciate you. Thanks to all the people who showed up on Saturday. Thanks to the Holy Spirit first and foremost. Thanks to God our Father who continues to be faithful to us and who continues to raise the standard of the encounter, always giving us an encounter and therefore always ensuring that the name of the event is upheld. Put your hands together. He's worthy. Hallelujah. One second, family. Give me one second, family. family have a good night see you everyone 876-319-5163 is the whatsapp number if you want any information i love you see you tomorrow bye bye 876-319-5163 i love you family bye bye